This is a feminist analysis of the Halo prequel book, The Fall of Reach, written by Eric Nyland in 2001 to flesh out the backstory of Halo Combat Evolved. A second edition was released in 2010 with some new scenes added, but from what I've browsed through at Barnes & Noble, too cheap to get a new book, I don't think it really changes the plot that significantly, besides trying to work the anime shorts into canon. So I'm gonna work with this book, released in 2001. The book was also adapted into graphic novel form by Marvel, but I haven't read this version. I'm gonna post some pictures to illustrate characters, but these come from Halopedia, and I don't know the significance of their inclusion. <laughs> the Fall of Reach is not a very good story. I think it's well regarded by Halo fans because Eric Nyland pretty much built the entire Halo world. Bungie had some ideas for the story that they'd outlined on the website, kind of about how the civilization came to be, but Eric Nyland really explored what the world looks like in 2552, which is when most of the Halo series takes place. He created the Magnetic Accelerator Cannon space stations, which then featured prominently in Halo 2. The Fall of Reach is the forerunner of the Halo series. It's the world builder, Tier 1. It does not, however, have a very good plot. Its plot is probably the worst in the series, with terrible characterization and characters of such dubious morality that I find myself rooting for the antagonists. Later in the series, these issues were presented as moral shades of gray, making the characters complex, but it's very simple and straightforward in The Fall of Reach, and I'm pretty sure the author didn't consider the characters that complex. With the exception of Dr. Halsey, who discusses the moral implications of what she's doing at one point, Still. Now, this is not going to be a review of the book in general. I'm going to summarize it and talk about the female characters. I want to make it clear that even though you might pick up this book and read these female characters with terrible characterization and blandness, this is not because the author doesn't like the female characters. It's because it's a bad book. The male characters have similar problems. The gist of the plot is that in the 26th century, the human race is governed by the unified Earth government, a single entity, and humanity has spread out and has terraformed various planets throughout the spiral arm of the galaxy. And then some planets start to rebel against the main government in a manner similar to the uh, U.S. Civil War, and the rebels are considered uniformly bad, similar to most depictions of the Confederates in uh, American literature. This rebellion, which is later dubbed the Insurrection, lasts several decades, so genius scientist Dr. Catherine Halsey conceives of and becomes the head of the Spartan II program. The Spartan II program trains these super soldiers to fight for the UNSC, the United Nations Space Command, in the service of Earth and all her colonies. The Spartan II program, however, does not select volunteers. It abducts civilians, specifically civilian children. The Spartans are abducted at six years old and are basically brainwashed into being mindless tools of the UNSC and are subjected to these augmentations that cause them to become super powerful and are given Mjolnir armor to become basically unstoppable. The Spartans put a major dent into the insurrection, but they become most useful after first contact is made with the Covenant, a theocratic alien alliance bent on the destruction of the human race for as of yet unknown religious reasons. The UNSC learns that the Covenant has a ruling class called the Prophets, and a mission is planned for the Spartans to go in and grab a prophet, take him back to Reach, 
which is the military stronghold planet of the humans, and then negotiate a truce with the Covenant. Dr. Halsey's intellectual abilities might be necessary to infiltrate a Covenant ship, so she needs to come along, but Dr. Halsey herself is a civilian and unfit for combat situations, so she makes a flash clone of her brain, basically taking um, her, her uh, adult brain and making a copy of it with all her memories. And this brain is then used to create an artificial intelligence, a smart AI, which means sapient smart. And this smart AI is Cortana. With all her memories, Cortana is basically a post-human copy of Dr. Halsey but the full implications of this won't be gone into until Halo 3. Cortana is told to select a Spartan partner, and Cortana selects John 117, the Master Chief from the games, because he's the most lucky. Lucky me. There's this training to make sure they work out as partners, and this psychopath called Colonel Ackerson tries to kill them, but they survive and become this, uh, bonded partnership. They're all ready to start their mission to capture a prophet when the Covenant suddenly show up and invade Reach. From the title alone, you can probably tell where this is going. They fight until John 117 is the only Spartan left, and then they beat a retreat in the ship Pillar of Autumn, making a jump away from any human establishments so as not to lead the Covenant there. In the Fall of Reach, there are several female characters. These include Dr. Halsey, the AI Deja, as in Deja Vu, the Spartans Kelly 087, and Linda 058, Lieutenants Hall and Aki Hikoa, an unnamed UNSC leader, and last but certainly not least, Cortana. Dr. Halsey is a cold scientist committing great crimes because she believes the UNSC is worth it, the Unified Earth Government. Her character evolves and becomes much more interesting in the later books, but as of The Fall of Reach, she's pretty much just a cold scientist. When examining the young John as a potential candidate for the Spartan program, she completely dehumanizes him. It's revealed later that she does care but suppresses her emotions, so to justify taking away the humanity of 75 children for the purpose of maintaining the UNSC's control over the spiral arm. Now, I don't believe that the Spartans are really inhuman, but them being inhuman is a theme of the Halo series, so yeah. The fact that Dr. Halsey comes to regard John as sexually attractive 35 years in the future is a bit creepy, though. Eric Nyland later said in 2008 that Dr. Halsey is the smartest woman in the world, basically. My absolute favorite has to be Dr. Halsey, because this is a, a woman with a 200 IQ, and she's a real challenge to write. But I'm not sure this was established as of The Fall of Reach, so let's just say for the purpose of Halo The Fall of Reach that she's just really, really smart. Okay, she's a smart character. Although not of a military background, Halsey is smart enough to be able to know naval strategy better than the male Captain Wallace when his ship Commonwealth is engaged with the Covenant. She figures out a better strategy than him and tries to tell him what to do. He doesn't like that, and he threatens to have her bound and gagged. And... This is entirely based on a military versus civilian conflict. It's a man threatening a woman when she challenges his authority, his ability to command properly. I don't think it's anti-feminist. In a sense, it's feminist that he can threaten her like that in that situation and have it be based on a completely different conflict. Men and women are equal, and that doesn't enter into it. And she turns out to be right, so he's just a jackass. Then there's the AI, Deja. Deja is a dumb AI. 
meaning that she's not sapient. She's just computer programming imitating a person. She's the Spartans' teacher when they're young and learning how to be warriors for the UNSC. There's not a whole lot to her character. She's pretty much just the kind, authoritative teacher. Unlike Dr. Halsey, she is completely devoted to the UNSC, its utilitarian goals, and doesn't care about um, abusing the Spartans. I get the feeling that Eric Nyland introduced her specifically to demonstrate how technology has evolved by 2517, which is when she's introduced. Kelly is introduced as part of the main trio of Spartans, the other members of which include John and Sam034. All of the Spartans are abnormally fast. John is implied to have caught a coin out of the air after choosing which side it would fall on, but Kelly is faster than all of them. When she takes off running, no one can catch her. When she gets her augmentations and Mjolnir armor, she's the fastest thing alive. She also has a somewhat more creative personality, dyeing her hair blue. She seems more adventurous than John, but also seems more likely to let her emotions override her reason. When John gives the order to have a wounded Sam stay behind on a Covenant ship to sacrifice him for the majority, Sam accepts it immediately, but Kelly questions his authority and gets all emotional, and then when they're escaping together, John um, is getting upset, but reins it in, keeps it inside, while Kelly clings to him emotionally. I'm not saying soldiers can't express emotion, but it seems a bit sexist to have Kelly be the one to have such an emotional breakdown and endanger the mission. John is emotional, but retains a stoic demeanor. Kelly also has a somewhat stereotypical moment with fellow Spartan Linda when preparing to infiltrate a rebel base. The UNSC provided the same outfits as the rebel crew, and Kelly holds up this grease-stained overalls and says they don't really give a girl much to work with. Linda then offers her a black bodysuit and tells her to try it on for size. The moment evokes the stereotyped idea that women always care what they look like and fashion and such. It's somewhat turned on its head by the fact that they're discussing military equipment, but the stereotype is still evoked. Like Kelly, Linda is a very capable Spartan, noted for her exceptional sniping skills. In the book First Strike, John notes that Linda might be a better Spartan than him because of her sniping skills, but that's for Strike. At the time of Fall of Reach, she's just another Spartan, but with the implied battle prowess of any of them. She performs well in combat, but doesn't have John's luck. Lucky me. She helps John and James on a mission, but sustains injuries and dies. At the time, though, John was the last of the Spartans in Halo canon. This is what it said in the Halo Combat Evolved manual, and Eric Nyland couldn't go against that. He was constrained by canon. And that was the setup for the game. They didn't know anything about female Spartans or whatever, so even Bungie can't be blamed for that. In First Strike, however, Nyland revives Linda, and through the powers of time travel, Kelly is saved as well. So I don't think their deaths reflect negatively on the author or even Bungie. The minor characters, Lieutenants Hall and Akihikoa, are members of Keyes' bridge crew, and their purposes are pretty much identical in that they're both good at their jobs. This is in contrast to the obnoxious man, Lieutenant Jaggers, who continually grouses and gets angry at Captain Keyes and defies his authority. Hall and Hikoa may get worried, but they obey Keyes and, as a result, help save the day. Eric Nyland has Keyes narrate about the character's individual personalities, like that Hall is an overachiever, and that Hikoa looks delicate but has nerves of steel. But the characters are so minor that Keyes has to tell us what they're like. They don't get a chance to illustrate it. Following the Battle of Sigma Octanus IV, 
John makes a report to several UNSC leaders masked in darkness. The identities of these people are not revealed. One of these unknown leaders is a woman who interrogates John regarding what he observed in a museum that contained alien artifacts. She seems very knowledgeable about geological composition of the artifacts and the significance of them, and she discusses with the other leaders the forerunner glyphs observed in a covenant transmission. She is possibly the basis for Margaret O. Perungoski, the Office of Naval Intelligence Director. As she is a Ghost of Onyx character, I can't assume that her identity was really understood as a character at the time of Halo the Fall of Reach. So, in Halo the Fall of Reach, let's just say Eric Nyland created this female leader who seems pretty capable, running things in the background. And of course there's Cortana. Cortana is an amazingly powerful, smart AI, and she's got Halsey's memories, and this makes her somewhat like Catherine Halsey when she was a teenager. Because she's powerful as an AI, she engages in this self-serving behavior for which Halsey herself would probably show restraint, such as hacking her way into ONI files to reassign Colonel Ackerson to the front lines as punishment for nearly killing her. Like her brain donor, Cortana surmises that Spartan John 117 would make the best partner, both because of his luck and noting that both she and Dr. Catherine Halsey find him sexually attractive, which sets the stage to our Cortana John romance. Cortana fits into John's life as his intellectual partner, almost a literal homunculus, controlling his actions from inside his head. Without her visual depiction, there is also none of the unfortunate sexualization found in the games. The Fall of Reach's Cortana is not victimized as is Halo 3's, and she is free to be strong and bold and just a cool female character. I'm not sure how well the Bechdel test works for novels, but The Fall of Reach passes. Dr. Catherine Halsey and Cortana, as well as Halsey and Deja, talk about things other than men, such as internal politics and morality. The original Halo novel, The Fall of Reach, contains a lot of female characters that aren't devoid of sexist cliches, but are generally treated pretty well. I imagine the author included these characters and their positive depiction as a way of saying that the UNSC is more gender equal than our own U.S. military in the present. In the Fall of Reach, women can be as capable warriors as men, even within the elite Spartan program, even having capabilities beyond those of the main man. The Fall of Reach is really just the start of the expanded universe of the Halo series, defining the basic structures of the world, but not having good characterization within it. When I read through the book, I want to say that Halsey has the best characterization overall, or Jacob Keyes, or Cortana, but the truth is, none of them do. They're all just in a poorly written book. It took later entries in the Halo series to make Halsey and Cortana the fleshed-out female characters I appreciate, and this is really just an introduction to them. The Fall of Reach really just gave us a world, and the characters are limited enough that analysis of them can never be that deep as in other entries in the Halo series.